Um, and one of the systems that I believe in is making our teachers experts in the curriculum and developing systems in which we can pull from their expertise. And so when we develop curriculum at Frontier, we really look at uh, first place, we look at uh, the standards and we brought our teachers together to really focus on, there's a lot of standards, but to really come together and what standards are really valuable and important to us and remain focused on those standards. And then we mapped it out. So we had a, um, we have a map of curriculum and then we look at data, <laughs> don't know why and then we look at the data, but one of the things we really do is pull together periodically in these data meetings to really look at what students may be left be, being left behind. And the way we look at it is we focus on the standards and then we ensure that we have the resources available. The resources may be literacy footprints, the re resources may be the Lucy Calkins writing. And we develop a wealth of resources for the teachers to pull from when they're uh, instructing on those standards. And then we take a workshop approach um, in our curriculum in which each of the teachers instruct directly. Uh, and then the students have time for practice. And then we firmly believe after that instruction and time for practice that there has to be time to share it with your community, whether you're sharing it with your peers or you're bringing it out into the school community as a whole um, or going out into some kind of internship in the community. So the workshop model is direct instruction, time for um, practice, uh, sharing it with peers and bringing it out into the community. And then the final step is reflection. So um, I have to work, I do work very closely with our teachers and our curriculum director uh, to pull together that system. Oh, the one thing I left out of that too is when you're building a very strong integrated, and remember that's a, a 21st century skill is to really integrate that curriculum and design it for the whole child. Sometimes we're very good at the academics, but um, embedding social emotional learning into that, um, embedding boundaries and relationships and working with students to understand that uh, into the curriculum and into the day. And once you're developing that, we can't forget the importance of professional development. So once we have our curriculum built, we understand our standards, we understand our approach, we understand our resources, we need to connect that with professional development with our, for our teachers to be able to utilize those resources. Um, and we also put our resources out into, we use Atlas. So having some form of platform in which the teachers can go grab the resources that they need to be able to teach that curriculum. Hi, Karen, my name is Haley. I'm a, I'm a parent and school committee member. Uh, my question is, can you share with us the evolution of your understanding of the importance of social emotional skills and affective learning in students, how and why they're important? How have you supported this type of learning amongst your students and faculty? And what measures would you take to support the skills in the Gil Montague district? All right, that was a three parter and I didn't write everything down. So I'm going to try to hit upon everything. Uh, I'll go back to my background and my evolution in understanding social emotional learning. Um, again, my background is working with disenfranchised youth and um, then it developed um, and kids, adolescents with social significant social emotional uh, difficulties. Uh, so making that connection and developing that relationship, but also understanding um, what skills to target. When somebody is having social emotional difficulties, it usually comes down to there, there might be some form of trauma, uh, there may be something that they've experienced, but it's also a skill deficit. Um, and learning to understand social emotional learning and being able to pinpoint what skills we do need to teach uh, students has been something that I've been involved with my entire career. Uh, again, my I eventually went back for my master's. It was in mental health counseling. And then I, when I got my master's, I came to back up to New England and I started working at Mahar. Um, it was a school adjustment counselor, but at the time that I was working at Mahar, what was missing there was programs for students or uh, individualized program and understanding for students with social emotional difficulties. And a lot of the students were going out of district or being sent immediately out of district. 
And what I realized is I couldn't just work with the students. I had to work with the teachers as well and develop those relationships between the teachers and the students. Um, and some of the most rewarding experiences I had um, was when teachers asked me to sit down with a student to really understand where they were coming from and what their needs were. Um, so now one of the things and where I have involved um, to this day, uh, working at Frontier, is we do work with a multi-tiered system of support where we recognize students academically uh, need various interventions. But we're also working with a multi-tiered system of supports for social emotional learning as well. So we're developing these tiers in which we have our curriculum that all students access, but then an understanding that we might have some groups of students that might have a skill deficit in which they need a different level of intervention. And then even a third tier where we might work one-on-one -on -one with students. And the other thing with social emotional learning that we can't miss out on as well is community and family engagement as well. Uh, because when we're working with students with social emotional difficulties, sometimes uh, we need to develop the skills in the parents as well because it can be very stressful working with students with social emotional difficulties, uh, especially if we don't give the skills to the parents and the teachers, and we just build it on as something else in the curriculum that the teachers are taking on. We need to do it in a way where the teachers feel like they have the resources and that they also understand the system in which they're gonna be supported to be able to work on social emotional and to be able to work with the whole child. Thank you. Did I hit all three? <laughs> I, I, I wasn't sure if you spoke to um, what you would do in our district in particular. Mm -hmm. The first thing I would have to really look at in your district is I really have to get to know the district and I'd have to get to know the people. I'd have to get to know the teachers um, and really sit down and find out. Um, we do know right now that social emotional self-regulation issues are some of the most challenging things that we're experiencing in school districts. And it can be very disruptive to the teacher. It could be very disruptive to the classroom. So I think the very first place is to start is to listen and to hear some of the difficulties that uh, the teachers are experiencing, the students are experiencing, the parents and the community, and to really listen to it from their perspective. So people, it's important that feel heard and feel supported. And that would be the first step. And then also see what you're using currently for curriculum and to design systems in which we can really embed that in curriculum into the entire school community and give the teachers the resources to implement it. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you. you. Jen? Okay, so um, I'd like to know how you would ensure that the district is providing support and enrichment to English learners who fail to meet or exceed the learning standards. How it would go to English Learners, I'm sorry, I just heard a bop upstairs in my house. <laughs> it just took me I, I can repeat it. How would you ensure that the district is providing support and enrichment to English learners who fail to meet or exceed learning standards? Again, we'd have to really kind of uh, sit down with the teachers and sit down with the families um, and understand what is happening, uh, what we currently have, um, and go back to the data and really see where we're missing our target. Uh, incorporating direct instruction to the English language learners, but also really looking at how we're, they're embedded in our community um, and what opportunities they have to be engaged in the, in the school community. I think it would really take an analysis of where the shortfalls are um, if they're not developing, at the, developing the skills at the rate that they, they should be. Um, and really pull together a team to analyze what it is that we can do. Um, I, I don't, I'm not actually in the community right now, so I'm not, it, it's hard to answer what you do have. So I think the starting point would be to really sit down and see what you're doing now in Gil Montague and uh, really work together and pull together our resources and pull together a team of experts to work together. One of the things I did um, as a special education director three, two years ago is we pulled together a special education strategic planning team. And so it was 15 educators, um, a diverse group of educators. And the very first thing we did is we set to our, a common goal, a common vision that we thought was very important to us, um, which was to um, increase inclusive practices to, to develop a multi-tier system of support and uh, to decrease the impact of disabilities um, on people. 
And we work together for the entire year to not just set our vision, but to also then to look at our foundation and to design avenues that we thought would be uh, help us and guide us to our vision. And we brought that strategic plan then out to the entire school community. Um, and it was very invigorating for the entire community to be engaged in our strategic plan and then break it down and see how our teachers uh, started to slowly, at first it was very scary for them to be involved in a much more inclusive programming. And before I knew it, we had a group of core teachers that were very excited to have some of our most disabled students in their classes. And we started with those volunteers and it bled into the entire community that was excited then to help with our most significantly needy students. And I think you do the same with the English language learners. It's really find your core group to um, build that strategic plan of how you're going to improve it. Thank you. Thank you. Cassie? Um, that kind of leads into this next question. Can you just briefly describe your experience with special education laws, compliance, and supporting uh, special education programs throughout your district? I consider, I, I am the disparate expert on laws um, and compliance and regulations. Um, I consider it my responsibility to have a, a very thorough understanding of the written laws, the written regulations, the intent of the regulations, and also how to bring that information to a broader public uh, to really understand the intent of the regulations and how they impact us. Uh, one of the first things I would say to everybody when I had a very thorough understanding of regulations and laws is I have such a thorough understanding of regulations and laws that I can use them to guarantee no one can do anything, but that's not the intent of the law. It's not the intent of the regulation. It's to give us guidance to do the things that we need to do um, and how to do them properly. So uh, I have a very thorough knowledge of special education laws and regulations um, and how to bring them into our community in a meaningful and purposeful way and then to build how we reach out to students with special needs. Understanding of special education regulations. What was the second part? Cassie? My, my understanding of it and then how I yes supporting special education programs in your district so then it's it's one thing to have an understanding of the laws and regulations but it's another thing to design a system in which you're actually not just implementing the laws and regulations but you're designing systems to meet students needs and that is one of my areas of expertise is to design the system. We believe in a continuum of services. We believe in building the district's capacity before we send students out. And that's a very complex system. It's a very tiered supportive environment in which I work very closely with teachers um, and other administrators, our principals and our curriculum director to build those integrated and inclusive communities. I could give you more details if you'd like, but I think uh, as the director of special education at Frontier, I'm very proud of the system that we've built. At the elementary school level at this time, we do not have any student out of district in, any, um, in our elementary schools. Um, so we were able to build a continuum of services to develop our resources within our schools. And one of the most important parts of that is for teachers to work collaboratively and to learn from each other's expertise. Um, I think has always been very helpful to us. Thank you, Heather. Hi, Karen. I'm Heather. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Heather. Um, how do you find the right balance between improvement and innovation, particularly with limited resources? The right balance between improvement and innovation? First place, it's a, it's a lot of hard work um, in developing a curriculum and developing uh, systems that meet the diverse needs. So it's very important that no matter what we do, we do it in an integrated and collaborative way. And I'm a firm believer that one of the things you need to do is ensure that you are embedding creativity and joy in everything that you do. 
Um, and so we really do that by supporting our teachers and supporting our community and understanding where everybody is, uh, those various perspectives again. Uh, so improvement is really hard work, but I think if you come from, uh, you know, I just said I'm an expert in, in uh, regulations and law. If that's all people hear you talking about is regulations and law and compliance, you've really lost them. Um, so it's my job to understand the regulations and the laws and to build our systems around them, uh, but not to just be walking around saying compliance, compliance, this is what you need to do. To really engage teachers and in which they feel trusted, in which they feel empowered, in which they feel engaged, in which they come to work some days and, and, and Oh. To be respected. I also think it's very important that everybody give place to share their ideas. Um, and that's where you really get that creativity and that joy and that innovation is if you're in a safe place to think outside the box. What I always say is you need a place to think outside the box and then it becomes my job to take those ideas outside the box and put them in the box. Um, so I think that's one of the way to get the balance is to enjoy what you do and to bring that alive to all the people around you. Um, but simultaneously know that it's your, also your job to do that hard work and understand um, and to look at the data and to look at the regulations and design those systems around them. Thank you. Thank you. This is Jane again, and I'll take the next one. Um, what has been your role in budget planning and development? I play a very strong role in uh, budget planning and development. I work very closely with the business manager and the principals and the superintendent. Boy, and our, our uh, building and operations director um, and everybody in, in budgeting. So one of the things I say about budgeting is everybody's familiar with uh, the local budget. Uh, but when I'm doing budgeting I, uh, budgeting, I also need to look at school choice. I need to look at circuit breaker. I need to look at grants. I need to look at all those offsets as well and really build them um, into the budget as I'm bringing it forward. One of the things I also very familiar with budgeting is the importance of encumbering and doing purchase orders and really tracking your budget. As a special education director of student services, I work with the most flexible budget um, I don't like surprises and like to see things coming, but sometimes there are surprises. Um, and then when you're working with the, the budget, you really have to go in and work together with the other administrators when you need to make changes. Um, so I have a very thorough understanding of budget. I work very closely. I'm constantly looking at budget. Just today in my office, I realized since I won't be going there as often as I have that I need to get access at home to be able to say, Five budgets, we have five budgets, uh, five different budgets, five different school committees. Um, and then I will have access to the budget live and be able to look at all those line items from my home uh, because I do that on a daily basis. I'm constantly looking at the budget, constantly talking the budget and constantly designing the budget. Right now we're working in this year's budget and as you all know in school committee, very focused on next year's budget as well. So it's, it's something I'm constantly always focused on. Thank you. Tommy? Hi, Karen. Thomasina Hall. I'm a former employee of the, of the district. So I'd like to hear briefly what your experience has been, if any, with collective bargaining and also communicating with unions and what you feel would be the role of principals, in, uh, superintendent, and school committee in the negotiating process. Mm -hmm. um, I think the superintendent, the true collective bargaining is much the superintendent and the school committee are very um, actively engaged in that process. I am very familiar with our union represent, representation and I talk to them on a, on a, on a regular basis. Um, although I can't say in my role right now that I am actively engaged in every aspect of the collective bargaining because that really does pertain to the role of the school committee and the superintendent. But uh, being the director of student services, I'm very actively engaged in talking about uh, one of the very first things our superintendent talks about when they went walking into the collective bargaining is coming to us, the principals, the director of student services and saying, what kind of things are out there? What are people talking about? What are, what are their concerns? 
as far as our paraprofessionals. Uh, one of the things that we've talked about in the past is they had a union, but it's all paraprofessionals. And we understand that there's various degrees of skills and needs and roles uh, for the paraprofessionals. And really kind of working to understand that it's actually a very complex contract. It's not just one group of paraprofessionals, but how do we do that? How do we break it down so we understand some paraprofessionals have certain training? Um, how many jobs do we have available? So my, my background is really getting into those conversations and those discussions, uh, not so much the collective bargaining for uh, specific contract, very specific contract negotiations, because our role is, is protected in some ways, the school committee and superintendent and not getting everybody involved directly at the table. Uh, but I'm very much um, talk about it quite a bit. And as my role as director of student services, working with coming to agreements at the table and understanding various perspectives and understanding what it is we're trying to achieve and the importance of keeping that community together and respecting each other um, as we put different viewpoints on the table and being able to move forward um, and also understanding the needs of the town as a whole and working with our uh, finance committees and our town administrators uh, to understand uh, the possibilities as we're moving forward. I do understand the importance of that and do have, have been engaged in those conversations uh, for a number of years. Thank you, Heather. Hi, uh, what are your plans for coaching and mentoring administrators? My plans for coaching and in, I, I've met the administrators uh, and they seem and express uh, how they see themselves as a very strong team. And I think that is one of the most important parts of coaching and supporting administrators is developing a very strong team approach uh, where they trust you as a leader and they trust you as somebody they can bring information to and work very closely with. Um, so the, the, the coaching piece starts with developing those trusting relationships and continuing that strong team approach uh, and building upon that really strong team approach. Um, uh, the administrators that I meet are very excited uh, to build the district and to bring ideas to the table and to work collaboratively and co cohesively. Uh, so if there's an area of need that they need to be coached on or to improve, it comes from a place to understand there's a lot of strengths and you can't be good at everything right away. Uh, so these are your strengths as an administrator and these are the things that would be really good to continue to work on and to build more information on uh, and to work together as a team and to draw from each other. Uh, I, the team cohesiveness and working together uh, is the most important part, but I, I do feel very comfortable in coaching um, and building skills because that's what makes us a strong team. What I say when I'm building teams, I work with people, I say a lot of times the very first question I ask is, and I ask it to you, is how many teams do you envision yourself on? If you stop for a second, you're on a lot of teams. You know, you're on your family team, you're on your work team, you're, you're on a team with the school committee. And then ask yourself a second question. How many of those teams would you describe as highly functioning? And then how do you get to highly functioning? Like you want to be a highly functioning team and it's okay to sometimes say, well, we're a little bit missing the mark. We are a team and what do we build to be a highly functioning team? And that is something I think all teams should talk about is how do we build ourselves into the most highly functioning team we can be and how do we, in, increase the number of teams that people are on uh, and how do we improve those teams. Thank you. Um, Timmy is another one of our members who wasn't able to join us this evening, so I will ask her question. Um, how do you envision as superintendent reaching out to and collaborating with town officials, namely the select boards, finance committees, town administrators? 
that reaching out to them is just that the very first thing to do is to reach out to develop that relationship to ensure that there's ongoing communication and again trust and that understand at times we're working on we're working on the same team we're working for the town um, I'm the district superintendent and they may be in a different role for the town but it's important that we work collaboratively and be a highly functioning team and that I will at times be advocating for the things that the district needs and the resources that the district needs but we'll always be working as a town with the town administrators as a town administrator and be working um, to constantly reach out and to constantly have that communication and that trust that we can call upon each other at any time and have communication. That's one of the things that actually um, excited me when you mentioned what brought me to Gil Montague Regional School District um, and thinking about a superintendent is I see myself more and more growing in that area and the importance of not just working directly in the school district, but building, uh, working with the town administrators and working with state administrators and communities um, and developing those communities broader and broader and having those conversations really is exciting for me. Um, and I've been building my career and my voice more and more in that area as, um, outside of the school district and working with different town administrators and people at a state level. Oops. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Bill. Karen, can you briefly tell us about an educational success or accomplishments that you led or to which you made a significant contribution? And then also conversely, tell us about an effort or project that you led or assisted that didn't work out so well, and what did you learn from that? Mm -hmm. I think a project that I assisted with is uh, really looking at building the district as one unified system of support. Um, I think in the 11, 12 years ago when I first started, uh, there was always this idea that Karen was the special special education director and then there were principals and the curriculum director and I would work on things that were special education and the thing that I think we do amazingly well uh, and have worked on is incorporating our resources all into one system of support and that is uh, that our special education teachers our speech language pathologists our reading specialists there are times during the day where they all push into the classroom and they work collaboratively with the teacher and they may even switch groups. Our special educators at times may even be working with our highly, most highly advanced uh, students academically and just working with them so uh, the general education can teacher may be able to see a different approach. So I think the thing that I've worked on the most that I think is the most successful is to really look at those collaborative efforts and to see ourselves as a unified team working for all students, not in isolated silos. Uh, it can be very lonely when you're a teacher and it could be also very scary when you start to say, hey, we're gonna work collaboratively. Um, it's not a word that you just wake up in the morning and decide you're gonna be collaborative. It takes effort, it takes trust. Um, and it, it really kind of takes a team approach. So I think my biggest success is developing that team approach and just developing those collaborative efforts in which we're all working together as one system of support and developing a continuum of services throughout the district. I think that is my greatest success. Uh, with that said, I think, I think there are times you have to make some moves um, and make some decisions in which you might not have gotten all the, uh, you might not have gotten everybody on board well enough uh, and sometimes it doesn't quite work. I sometimes say things are moving so fast sometimes you have to make a decision in which you put the cart before the horse and I'll really run around behind and make sure we get things situated if uh, the right way. But there are some things that uh, we put the cart before the horse and realize we'll never be able to quite fix it. Uh, we might have to just kind of abandon this uh, 
And there's some things I think quite early on when we had a lot, we started to see more and more students with autism in the district. Uh, we started to look at bringing in consultants to work with uh, students, with teachers to work with students with autism in their classrooms. And the kind of the way the teachers saw that is that person wasn't working directly with the students, was just kind of coming in as a consultant and kind of telling them what to do. And so they felt like there were, and we kept talking about inclusion. So there were more and more students in their classroom where they felt that it was their responsibility to work with that student. And they had an expert in the room who was consulting, but not working directly with the students and showing them how to do it and that we didn't have a continuum of services. So I think just taking a BCBA or a consultant and saying, oh, this is the answer and putting them in there without really designing those relationships and those collaborative relationships with the teachers and showing how the continuum of services will work, it kind of fell flat um, and we had to rethink of how we were doing that and eliminate, eliminate that consulting position for a while. Um, and really come back around to how we were going to see either BCBAs or experts or students with autism uh, working directly with students and modeling it and actually having times where they work collaboratively with the teachers and really defining that role. I think where it fell flat is we didn't define the role well enough and that we didn't get teachers on board and that they didn't feel supported when we were doing it. Thank you. Hi, Karen. Um, what means of communication do you use currently in engaging with the community? Uh, what have you found to be most, most successful and have you tried any that have not been successful? I, I, think, I think you need to have many ways to engage with the community. Um, I have meetings with parents. I've, I think one of the things that's successful was at first, I'd always think parents would just call me if they had a problem, and uh, parents would just like reach out and they'd know my role, and they just. Uh, and then I realized, no, parents aren't going to just reach out because sometimes it's intimidating for them to say, "Hey, I'm just going to reach out to the director of student services." Uh, so really, finding ways in which I am visible. Um, with parent on ways, um, engaged in ways where they might not even come um, in various roles, sometimes even taking my hat off um, and just kind of being in a different role for a while and being able to listen. So I, um, I do go to a lot of my role is, so people do over time feel more and more comfortable touching base with me and communicating. I also use uh, Zoom now uh, <laughs> to, to talk to uh, a lot of folks um, and be engaged. And I, I actually think it's a tool that's not gonna go away. Um, and um, find myself uh, recently uh, talking more and more with faculty and opening that up. Uh, it's actually a really great tool to, we have had 50 or 60 faculty members to bring them information by shooting out an email and everybody kind of comes together in the last week. Uh, so I do write and communicate and uh, send out um, updates to families and parents. I also have a group of parents that I work very closely with that I kind of see as ambassadors, if you will. Uh, they're very comfortable calling and talking to me and letting me know what some of the concerns are, or some of the things that people are excited about, um, and they just bring it to the table and, and touch base. And so I think it's really important to have those relationships. I don't know if I just got, I don't know if I got into detail and not, uh, enough detail about the various ways, but um, email, being visible, uh, writing newsletters and updates and communicating and finding ways to broadcast that information. Um, and one of the things that's really important to broadcast is the exciting things going on. 
I think sometimes our community misses that. I don't think we have enough ways where we're ahead of the game and sharing these are the exciting things. It's so much easier. It's broadcasted either in the newspaper or through social media or things like that. Some of the things that go wrong um, that I think it's going to be very important that we find ways to highlight um, and share with the community some of the exciting things going on in the district. Thanks, Karen. Uh, this is Haley again. Can you discuss your perspective on the leadership of a district with declining enrollment? I think all districts right now are experiencing declining enrollment for um, because we have a declining population. And then with our school choice, uh, system of school choice, uh, different, it's affecting diff districts differently. Um, some districts are receiving more school choice students. Some students are, some districts are losing more school choice students. And we all know, no matter what district you're in, because we all care about our neighboring districts, uh, that if you're losing school choice students, that's a major problem, that there has to be ways for us as a district to retain those students. Um, one of the things that stood out when I was looking quickly at um, your fiscal year 21 statistics is the losing of uh, students from middle school to high school. Um, it, it kind of stood out that the number of students drops, even though there's only three grades in the middle school and four grades in the high school. Uh, and it was actually brought to my attention, I think by a, a student um, that one of the difficulties is really feeling like there's a comprehensive curriculum uh, that really excites the students in which they feel like they're actually learning uh, a number of skills and not just those standard-based skills um, and meeting those credits. Uh, so I think bringing those innovative and creative ideas in which students continue from middle school to high school where families feel like they really do want for their child to stay in their home district and they have reasons to. And I think one of the ways to do that is voices heard. Um, I think we do have, a, we, <laughs> we do have a lot of, there is a lot of exciting things going on in Gail Montague Regional School District. There's a lot of work to be done as well. But again, getting out those exciting things are happening and then really listen and then play back that strategic plan to the community that it feels heard and then attainable goals, identify those attainable goals so you can mark it back out. Is this is what we've heard that is needed and these are the things that we're doing and these are the things we're achieving and really to keep those students um, is going to be a huge priority. And, and bringing other students in from other districts as well. So we're losing, you're losing the Gill Montague Regional, uh, the students from Gill and Montague but um, also the way I, I kind of think about it is how do you market that to other communities because you do no, need those school choice students um, and what would be those things whether they'd be I don't want to get ahead of myself because it would be a lot of work but whether it's vocational opportunities or if it's internships or if it's project-based learning that still keeps the rigor um, what would be those things and how do we identify it and how do we play it back to the community that it's actually available so we retain kids and that we reach out to neighboring communities so we're a small school district servicing a larger community thanks cassie so our district has been and expects to continue to be going through change. Can you discuss your perspective on leaderships during periods of change? Yes. Um, you know, just the word change can bring anxiety because uh, we don't know what it means. Does change mean we're getting rid of all the things that we once knew um, and enjoyed and helped us feel secure and helped us feel together as a community? Uh, so again, before we talk about change, we need to talk about the understanding of the community and what's important to the members of community of the community. So we don't want to just say change without really 
broadcasting and sharing that we know the community and we understand what's important to play back the values to be able to describe what our ch shared values are and that our change is going to help us grow towards those shared values and not going to just pull the rug out from under our community that we no longer appreciate and respect the values of our community so i think that's one of the things that when you're talking about change you really need to focus on and then in order to make that change you really need to before you start just moving towards change you really need to identify and develop a strong structural support a structural foundation so before you start changing it's almost like if you don't have a strong foundation and you tried to build towards change you don't have anything that you're building upon so we need to identify our vision but we also need to focus on what our foundation is and our foundation is our community our teachers our faculty our students and have them feel supported and engaged in that change that we're making um, so bringing them to the table identifying those values um, building a strong support and then we clearly define what those avenues of change what those avenues towards reaching that identified vision are going to be um, and i think it's important to clearly identify those avenues otherwise all you hear is there's going to be change and you don't know how that change is going to be made um, so when i did this strategic plan and frontier we identified what our vision was but then we called them avenues and we actually drew a diagram that this is our strong foundation this is our vision and we drew roads and we named them. So this is multi-tiered system of support. This is family engagement, and this is inclusive practices. And then we could show our, um, we build into those roadmaps what we have done uh, to help us reach that vision. So it's a visual that helps the community understand. Um, and it's a roadmap towards change uh, without just, throwing it out there that we're gonna change. We start by building a strong structural foundation. We start by having the community feel understood and pulling together shared values. So we're a unified community because we can't change if we're, uh, if it's being done in, in, a, in a divisive way. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, yes, Karen, can you discuss um, briefly, the most difficult personnel problems you have ever dealt with and how you resolved it? The most difficult personnel problems. Hmm. I think the most difficult personnel problems that I recognize is sometimes you work, this is really hard to say, but I sometimes you work with people who see themselves very differently than they present themselves and so they it's really hard because they don't see it's brought to your attention over and over that it may their presentation may be caustic or it may uh be hurtful towards children or it puts parents off or it's developing a, a difficult relationship with parents and you try to bring it to a person's attention in a very healthy supportive way but they don't recognize it uh so it becomes it it, it becomes even more apparent um every time they interact with people almost like and so the way to handle it is to first to bring the problem directly to the table and to do it in a supportive way in which you're offering professional development and support to explain that it's a problem and that it's causing a problem, um, to be clear on the expectations following the original conversation, to follow it up in writing, but it doesn't have to be done in a negative way. You could say these are the changes that we expect to be made and these are the supports and services that we'll put in place. And then if that doesn't work, it becomes, more difficult uh, in which you then have to follow up with a defined corrective action. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is personnel problems, it should be a very clearly defined system and it can start with support, but you also have to work through that system of then uh, developing corrective actions and eventually working with the union to understand 
how difficult the situation is and the possible removal of a person from their job, which is not the outcome anybody is ever working towards, but sometimes it's needed to happen. Um, so I've been involved with a lot of, over 12 years, a lot of different corrective actions and a lot of different outcomes and a lot of different ways to work with that. Um, but at the end of the day, you want a very clearly defined system uh, for your faculty, for your union, uh, and for your administrators, and to support your administrators uh, when they're involved in that process. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we do have just a few minutes left. If there's anything you'd like to add or anything you have thought of as you were answering questions, I know how that works. Sometimes you think back to something else and you think, I, I know what else I wanted to add to that. <laughs> anything mm -hmm. at all? Uh, thank you. I, I think what I, I really wanna add is, um, First place, thank you very much for your commitment to this process and for your innovation and change um, and having to work with a completely different system that I'm sure you had planned on uh, a month ago or even earlier um, and to be coming together to be able to do this. It's not easy for any of us. It's got a learning curve and causes a little bit of stress for everybody, even kind of hitting that button on whether or not the meeting is gonna uh, actually work out. So thank you very much uh, of coming together as a committee and doing this. Uh, some of the things that I wanna add is uh, every step of this process, I think meeting the administrators um, and the central office and having that opportunity to speak to them um, and the initial interview with a diverse group of re uh, representatives, uh, the questions, have been very thoughtful and the people I've had an opportunity to speak with um, make this opportunity more and more exciting along the way. Uh, so um, definitely um, everybody is very open and shares their enthusiasm and their commitment to the Gil Montague Regional School District, uh, but also very open and honest about what they would like to see happen and some of their concerns. Um, and that has been a great process, so thank you. Uh, so I don't know what more I would want to add besides I am somebody who very much does believe in, I see myself as a community builder. Um, I see myself as a person who brings my whole being into what I do, uh, that I am a systemic person, but I also believe in being a whole person and developing trust and relationship and teams um, as we're des designing those systems. Um, and bringing all different perspectives to the table and developing a collaborative approach um, and empowering our community, our faculty, and our teachers. And I, one of the things that excites me about this position is I, I believe what you need, if I may say, from the little bit I know, is a unifier um, and somebody who really brings the community together um, and is willing to pay attention to detail and the more bore, reading data is not boring and details not boring and developing systems not, but it's not something that everybody wants to do, um, but at the same time doing that more engaging and vibrant work of uh, bringing people to the table and exciting communities. Okay, thank you so much, Karen. We appreciate it. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. You enjoy it as well. and and. It worked out well because it wasn't a day to drive around. So, uh, thank no, you I think we've seen that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Bye bye.